Welcome learners. I am Dr. Pankaj Mittal. I am working as uh, Secretary General Association of Indian Universities. In fact, only the second women Secretary General of AIU in 97 years of its history. So today I will be speaking to you about access, equity and inclusion. Uh, as you all know that the national education policy which has come after 34 years and is a very, very innovative, democratic and student-centric policy, it talks a lot about the access to higher education. And you would also know that the access means access which is measured through the gross enrollment ratio that right now for our country is 27.1. That means, what does that mean? It means that out of 100 students in the age group of 18 to 23, only 27 students are enrolled in higher education. That looks bad because many of the developed countries have something like 67%, 71%, 75% at the gross enrollment ratio. And India, which is the second largest higher education system of the country, I mean, it is sometimes very surprising that we are the second largest higher education system of the country with more than 1,000 universities, more than 4 crore students, 15 lakh teachers, and something like 45,000 colleges is still very low in terms of gross enrollment ratio, which is only 27.1 right now. So the national education policy, it spoke a lot about access means access to higher education. It also spoke a lot about equity. When I say equity means access to higher education across say geographical boundaries, across uh, uh, various social groups, across various areas like rural urban or rich poor or SCST or minorities or means border hill area universities. So the access and equity go hand in hand. And the national education policy says that the access should be raised to something like 50% by 2035. That means that uh, out of 100 students in the age group of 18 to 23, and why I take 20, 18 to 23? Because that is a relevant age group in which the students are entering the higher education system. So the national education policy says that in the relevant age group of 18 to 23, by 2035, 50 percent of the students should be in the institutions of higher education. Now, how do we achieve it? So if we really want to improve the access, what are the possible ways of increasing the access to higher education? See, one very simple method will be that increase the number of universities and colleges. The government can be asked to increase the number of universities and colleges. But as you all know, it's not very easy because a lot of funding is involved in uh, opening new universities and colleges. So it can be open, but not to that extent, which can cater to the GE or of something like 50% by 2035. So what could be the second method? Second could be maybe increase the intake capacity of the existing program. So in a class, if you're uh, having say 30 students or 50 students, increase it to 70, 80. So that can also increase the access to higher education because more students will be enrolled in higher education. But again, as you know that it affects the quality because large group of students in a particular class will not be very good for imparting quality education, especially the personalized education which the NEP is talking about. And also there will be issues with regard to the infrastructure because every classroom will not be equipped to handle these many students. So what could be the other method? Maybe the third method could be that uh, uh, we can have the public-private partnership. That means we can encourage many, many uh, private institutions to run the, or rather maybe establish more universities and colleges so that the uh, students can enroll in those universities and colleges and we can increase the enrollment. That is a very good way of increasing it. But then there are quality issues associated with it because some private institutions are very good. They can be giving quality education, but some are there for profit motive also. So that could be a way, but then it has to be done with a lot of uh, sort of Carefulness. We have to be carefully selecting the private participation in higher education. But one, one novel way which I think of is uh, when we say that we do not have money 
to open more universities and colleges. And we also say that uh, there is a lot of unemployment in the country. Can you think of this novel idea that what is the uh, capacity of our higher education institutions and how much we are using them? Are we using them to the optimum uh, capacity? Is the optimum utilization of higher education institutions there? Now you all know that India has a large higher education system and that means we have so many universities, colleges with large infrastructure in terms of say buildings, labs, libraries, classrooms, such a large infrastructure and can you imagine how much time it is used? So if you just do a simple mathematics in UGC for a long time and we have been projecting that 180 actual teaching days are mandatory in a year. So that means out of 365 days, 180 actual teaching days means half of the year, half, half of the year is gone. And every day the university is not open for more than 8 hours. So the, that means one third of a day. So one third and one half will make it one sixth. So that means whole of our infrastructure we are using only for one sixth of the day. That means not more than 15 to 16 percent of utilization of the existing infrastructure. We cry at the top of our voice that India is a poor country. But are we a poor country if we are able to afford wastage of something like 80 to 85 percent of our existing infrastructure? Can we think of something like flexi timings in which the universities can open early in the morning, can work till late in the evening? At least we can think of doubling the time for which the universities and colleges are open so that the ex uh, existing infrastructure can be used for the maximum capacity. In the foreign countries I have seen, the universities open very early and they close very late in the night and so there is a possibility of having flexi hours. I am not talking of two shifts, morning shift, evening shift, I am talking of flexi hours in which some classes can be held in the morning, some in the afternoon, some can be held in the evening. So just imagine that if this happens, the whole infrastructure can be used to the maximum possible extent and if I am talking about double, so then we have already doubled the infrastructure without spending a penny except for on more teachers which will also address the issue of employment of teachers. So optimum utilization of resources is something which we should be doing for uh, increasing the access in addition to the methods which I have spoken so far. Another method which again the national education policy has given a lot of emphasis on is using the online methods of teaching. There are too many concepts. There is a concept of academic bank of credit where the students can be learning course wise. There is a concept of online teaching and now the university grants commission has said that any university which is uh, rated as a A grade university by NAC can be running online programs, means complete online programs. So the students can be enrolling in these programs in large numbers and that will also address the access issue in a big way and I am very sure that the online education will help in actually achieving the 50% gross enrollment ratio by 2035. So these were the possible ways in which we were thinking of increasing the gross enrollment ratio. But now let me take you to uh, something different and that is, uh, is GER a right method of assessing the uh, access to higher education? And we did a study, I mean, I, am a, I at AIU did a study and we did a, I published a paper in Economic and Political B Weekly which is available on eligible enrollment ratio. You know, <clears throat> how do we measure gross enrollment ratio? That is the number of persons enrolled in higher education divided by the number of persons who are in the age group of 18 to 23. But are all the people in the age group of 18 to 23 eligible to get admission in higher education? No. Who is eligible to get admission in higher education? The persons who have passed 12th class. So who will be the eligible population who will be able to get admission in higher education? That means persons in the age group of 18 to 23 who have passed 12th class. 
So if we see that population as the population, uh, as the base population from which the enrollment is there, and we did a study with say around 10 countries, and these 10 countries were USA, Germany, France, UK, China, Brazil, India, Indonesia, South Africa, and Pakistan. So these 10 countries we studied for a period of 2013 to 17 to see what is the difference between gross enrollment ratio and eligible enrollment ratio in these countries. And you will be surprised that India, which was almost at the end, means at number 8 in these 10 countries in the gross enrollment ratio, as soon as we use the term EER, eligible enrollment ratio, India's position climbed up. Because when we talk of gross enrollment ratio, we are talking of the total population. When we are talking of eligible enrollment ratio, we are talking of the eligible population. And when we talk of eligible population, India's EER, you know that India's GER is uh, 27, but India's EER was 65. And that was almost equal to the EER of developed countries. In fact, when we saw the... <coughs> difference in the GER and EER for different countries, we saw that the difference was too much for the developing countries and the difference was very less for the developed countries. So you can see in the graph that how the average GER and EER of 10 countries is there and you will see that in India it is 27 and 63.7 or 65 for India and there is a large difference of almost uh, 30, 30, more than 35 for India. But if you see the countries like USA, in USA the GER is 88 and the EER is 95. In Germany the U GER is 67 and the EER is 85. So the difference is very, very minuscule. But this difference becomes large for the countries which are developing countries like India. So what does that mean? It means that the gross enrollment ratio, which is a ratio of the enrollment of the total population and which we are thinking as a problem of the higher education system is actually a problem at the lower education, means at the school education. Because if we have enough population, say more population who are eligible to get admission in higher education, then with, with, with that base population and even if we have the existing like right now also if you see the transition rate large something like 90 percent students who are passing 12th class are going to higher education but the 12th pass outs are very less so with the same transition rate the ger can be reaching very high so therefore we have to address the problem at the school education we have to reduce the dropouts at the school level we have to increase the number of pass outs who are who are past 12th class and are eligible to get admission into higher education and the moment we increase that base the admission to higher education is already there even if the existing level of admission to higher education the ger will climb like anything and the 65 which i am telling you the 65 er is already comparable i mean we are talking of 50 but 65 is already there in india where the eligible enrollment ratio is almost comparable to any developed country therefore my opinion is that when we measure access and equity, we should be talking of both because GER is a concept which is widely used. So we don't say that GER should be not used at all, but GER should be used along with the EER. So GER and EER both together will decide that what is the actual scenario of access to higher education. We cannot depend upon only one parameter that is GER. We should be talking about GER and EER and then say where the India stands because GER is a concept which was developed by the western countries. So in India or the developing countries, ER maybe is a, a maybe it, it would be a better measure because it actually talks of the problem where it is, where to hit and where to address the problem. So with that I would uh, like to thank all of you for listening patiently and uh, I, I hope that both I mean uh, there were many suggestions which I gave today, but the two suggestions, one is optimum utilization of resources and second, using GER and EER both as parameters for uh, measuring the access to higher education would go a long way in measuring access and in projecting India in a better light in front of the world. Thank you very much. Happy learning. Keep learning. Thank you.